This is the June 2007 test. We're looking at passage number three. This is the one that starts talking about the World Wide Web. Is that right? All right. This is. I'm. I'm assuming this is going to be like a little interesting because this is a test from 2007. It's about a decade old or almost a decade old. So hopefully there'll be some comedy in here where the test is like showing its age a little bit by talking about the so-called web. Um, my, you know, general approach to reading comprehension is really just I have to comprehend this passage. I have to understand the main point of the passage. It's not reading memorization. It's reading comprehension. I'm going to, uh, as I read, I'm going to do two things. First is I'm going to continue asking the speaker over and over. I'm going to be asking, why are you wasting my time with this? If I keep asking the speaker, why are you wasting my time with this? It puts me in an aggressive mindset, which then is going to uh, help me to listen to what the speaker is actually saying. The second thing I'm going to do as I read is I'm going to pause frequently and I'm going to make little predictions about what I'm likely to read next. I'm going to say, oh, since you've said this, I think that you're next going to say this. And the analogy there is making a bet on a sporting event that you don't give a shit about. I don't give one shit about football. I'm sorry. I hate football. I don't care about football at all. But I like drinking and I go to bars. And if I'm in a bar and there's football, then there's only one solution, which is, well, the game's on. We're watching the game. So now I have to make a bet. If I make a bet on that football game, and it can be a beer, five bucks, whatever, but I make a bet on the game, and now, miraculously, I give a shit who wins the game. And that's like the little predictions that I'm going to make in the reading comprehension. Okay? Making a prediction as I read, it's not about being right or wrong, because I don't care who wins that football game, and I honestly don't care if I win or lose the beer. But I'm giving myself a rooting interest, and then when the game's over, I'll know who actually won. When the passage is over, you want to know what the passage actually said. So you pause after a sentence or two, maybe you pause after the first paragraph, and you say, oh, I think you're going to say this. Then you read on, and then you find out whether you were right or wrong. Whether you were right or wrong, you know what the passage actually said. That all make sense? It's fairly simple. I don't do any highlighting. I don't do any underlining. If all that stuff works for you, great. Uh, but in a lot of cases, those techniques that you learned somewhere along the line are not actually helping you to comprehend the passage. And if you do do a lot of underlining and you find that you're missing a lot of questions, you might want to experiment with not doing any underlining at all and see if you actually are following the passage better when you're not underlining. All right, here we go. The World Wide Web, a network of electronically produced and interconnected or, quote, linked sites called Pages that are accessible via personal computer raises legal issues about the rights of owners of intellectual property, notably those who create documents for inclusion on web pages. Some of these owners of intellectual property claim that unless copyright law is strengthened, intellectual property on the web will not be protected from copyright infringement. And there I'm thinking, well, yeah, isn't that kind of obvious? Like, we want to have stronger copyright law so that you can protect the copyright infringement. Although I'm going to actually predict that the passage is going to say the opposite of that. Because they just said some people claim, and when you say some people claim, you almost always turn around and say, but they're wrong. So let's see, there's my first prediction. Is that what they're going to say? Web users, however, oh, this is just the other side of the argument. Okay, so web users, however, claim that if their ability to access information on web pages is reduced, the web cannot live up to its potential as an open, interactive medium of communication. So we have uh, I'm, I'm seeing a conflict now, right? The first paragraph of this passage describes a conflict uh, between owners of intellectual property who want to strengthen copyright law to avoid copyright infringements, and then the web users say, hey, wait a minute, uh, if you do that, then we're not going to have as much ability to access information on web pages, and the web won't be this open, interactive thing that we're hoping for. My prediction at the end of the first paragraph would be something like, maybe the author is going to take a side. I don't know yet, right? The author has been even-handed on these two uh, stances so far. Maybe the author is going to prefer one side over the other. 
If I had to bet there, I would bet that the author would take the side of less copyright infringement or uh, less copyright protection. I would guess that the author, the LSAT is uh, written by legal academics or by academic people. Academic people tend to be kind of politically liberal. My guess would be that they would not be trying to present you with a passage that really says, yeah, we got to protect the Disney Corporation. That's just not likely to be on the LSAT. So if I had to guess, I would say they're going to go the other way, more of like a populist kind of a thing. But we don't know yet, so let's see what it actually says. Second paragraph. The debate arises from the web's ability to link one document to another. Links between sites are analogous to the inclusion in a printed text of references to other works, but with one difference. The cited document is instantly retrievable by a user who activates the link. This immediate accessibility creates a problem. Why? Since current copyright laws give owners of intellectual property the right to sue a distributor of unauthorized copies of their material, even if that distributor did not personally make the copies. So if person A, the author of a document, puts the document on a web page, and person B, the creator of another web page, creates a link to A's document, is B committing copyright infringement? Question mark. What do we think the passage is going to say from here? My guess would be no. My guess that the answer to this question is no, uh, according to this author. I'm, I'm guessing, just making kind of a wild prediction here, but I think they're going to say, nah, we could sue the first person who puts up, you know, if you take um, a Disney movie and you just put it on your website, we can obviously sue that person. But are we really going to sue someone who, like, creates their own website that points to that website? Seems actually kind of silly. So my guess is they're going to say no and probably give some reasons. I don't know. Third paragraph. To answer this question, oh good, you're going to answer it, good. It must first be determined who controls distribution of a document on the web. When A places a document on a web page, this is comparable to recording an outgoing message on one's telephone answering machine for others to hear. <laughs> okay, if you say so. I guess I follow the analogy. I make a web page, it's just there, anybody can access it if they want. I make a voicemail recording, it's just there, people can access it whenever they want. Okay, so I, I'm following the analogy. So what though? When B creates a link to A's document, this is akin to B giving out A's telephone number. Ah, thereby allowing third parties to hear the outgoing message for themselves. Hey, dude, listen to this crazy message that my friend put on his answering machine. Ha ha, isn't that so clever? I get it. I, I follow the analogy. Okay. Still, so what? Anyone who calls can listen to the message. That is its purpose. While B's link may indeed facilitate access to A's document, the crucial point is that A, simply by placing that document on the web, is thereby offering it for distribution. Therefore, even if B leads others to the document, it's A who actually controls access to it. Hence, creating a link to a document is not the same as making or distributing a copy of that document. And there we get the author's main point. Seems to me that's going to be the thesis of the entire thing. The author started by bringing up this conflict. Then the author said, I guess a little more in the second paragraph, the author fleshes out the conflict a little bit and gets to one specific question, which is, hey, if I link to copyright infringement, am I guilty of copyright infringement? The first half of the third paragraph, the author gives an analogy about uh, leaving an outgoing phone message and says that linking is like giving out someone's phone number and says actually the illegal distribution is happening when you create that phone message or when you create that web page, not when you give out the phone number or give out the link. And so right now, if I had to say, why are you wasting my time with this? The author would say, oh, I just wanted to tell you that uh, it's not copyright infringement to make a link on your website to a website that does copyright infringement. It's boring shit, you know? But I'm, I'm forcing myself to ask these aggressive questions and to make these predictions as I read. The very worst thing that happens, and I'm sure this happens to all of you very frequently, is that you read, you think you're reading, 
and you realize halfway through the thing that you've got nothing, like you have no idea what it's talking about, and now you have to go back up to the top, that's just the absolute worst, right? That's the enemy. So we're trying to make ourselves stay sharp and understand as we go, because I, I can't read this thing twice. I'm not reading it twice. I'm reading it once and I'm understanding what it says. I'm forcing myself to read it once and understand what it says. The making predictions thing is a nice little check-in because if you can't make a prediction about what's going to come next, then you're probably not following what it said previously. And if you're not following what it said previously, then you need to not continue reading. I think students make the mistake of their eyes are glazed over, that was already a mistake, but then they compound that mistake by continuing to read the passage when they don't understand what it already said. Now they don't know what it's said before. How do they know? How are they going to understand the rest of it? Right? It's not going to get easier to understand if you don't understand the top. So you've got to really make sure that you're understanding the beginning of the passage. All right, let me finish up here. So the last sentence that I read was, hence, creating a link to a document is not the same as making or distributing a copy of the document. Moreover, techniques are already available by which A can restrict access to a document. For example, A may require a password to gain entry to A's web page, just as a telephone owner can request an unlisted number and disclose it only to selected parties. Wow, they're just really going all in on this voice, the telephone answering machine analogy. They're continuing with the analogy. Okay, I get it. I get it. Such a solution would compromise the openness of the web somewhat, but not as much as the threat of copyright infringement litigation. I guess they're they mean as applied to every single person who links to any website on the entire web. Changing copyright law to benefit owners of intellectual property is thus ill-advised because it would impede the development of the web as a public forum dedicated to the free exchange of ideas, which was something that I predicted they were going to say. Okay, based on my, that's like sort of base assumptions about the makers of the test being kind of progressive-ish, populist-ish, leaning kinds of people. Okay? Why are you wasting my time with this? Oh yeah, I wanted to tell you that uh, it's not copyright infringement to link to a site that does copyright infringement. And furthermore, I wanted to go ahead and say, therefore, we should not strengthen copyright law in this way. Why? Oh, because I want the web to be an open, free exchange of ideas. That's it, okay? I've got the big picture of the passage. I don't have every little detail memorized, but I roughly know what's in the first paragraph, I roughly know what's in the second paragraph, and I roughly know what's in the third paragraph, and now I would turn to the questions. All right, so, and I'm gonna do the questions in order on the reading comprehension. So number 15, which one of the following most accurately expresses the main point of the passage? This is one where you have to have a good, strong prediction so that you don't get trapped by all the bullshit answer choices. I just said, I wanted to tell you that linking to another website that infringes copyright is not itself copyright infringement, and we should not strengthen copyright law. Because we want the web to be open up, whatever. Okay, A. Since distribution of a document placed on a web page is controlled by the author of that page rather than by the person who creates a link to the page, creating such a link should not be considered copyright infringement. You know what? I would be pretty happy with that. I'm, I'm, that has a lot of what I said. It's the first thing that I said when I was predicting what the main point was. I'm thinking it's going to be A. B says, Changes in copyright law in response to the development of web pages and links are ill-advised unless... That's not what the passage said. The passage never said, hey, we, sh we could maybe do this if whatever. I don't care what the rest of B says after the unless. B is wrong. C. People who are concerned about the access others may have to the web documents they create can easily prevent such access without inhibiting the rights of others to exchange ideas freely. Um, the passage said that. It's part of the passage, but that's not the main point of the passage at all. D. Problems concerning intellectual property rights created by new forms of electronic media are not insuperably difficult to resolve 
if one applies basic common sense principles to these problems, that is not at all what the passage was about. Basic common sense what? E. Maintaining a free exchange of ideas on the web offers benefits that far outweigh those that might be gained by a small number of individuals if a radical alteration of copyright laws aimed at restricting the web's growth were allowed. No one was ever talking about radically altering. That never was mentioned. Nobody was talking about laws aimed at restricting the web's growth. That was never talked about. I don't think anyone ever talked about Certainly no one ever said anything about far outweighing anything else. That was not mentioned. And I don't think anybody ever said anything about uh, a small number of individuals getting the benefit. So I, f I see like four different reasons why E is wrong. Uh, my answer here is A, because it really closely matches what I predicted. It's the main point of the passage. If you find yourself missing a lot of main point questions, I just got to tell you, you got to read the passage more closely. I'm sorry. Uh, oh. Some people, like, I've heard people say, should I read the questions first before I read the passage? Absolutely not. That's such a big waste of time. I mean, you know they're going to ask you what the main point of the passage is. So did you really need to read number 15 before you read the passage? No. They're going to also ask you about the author's primary purpose. They're going to also ask you questions about, like, the, the tone of the argument. Those three things, to me, are all the exactly the same thing. Main point is the main point. Primary purpose is to prove the main point. Tone is the way they made their argument, but it's just like, were you listening to the argument or not? They will also ask you detailed questions, but I am not like looking at the questions and real thinking about what detailed questions they're going to ask me before I read the passage, because I can always go back to the passage to look up the answer to those detailed questions, since I know what's in the passage. I know roughly where things are in the passage, so I will refer back to the passage to answer some of those detailed questions. Uh, I think reading the questions first is just a huge waste of time. Number 16. Which one of the following is closest in meaning to the term strengthened as that term is used in line 8 of the passage? I think we were talking about strengthening uh, copyright laws, right? Line 8, I'm going to go back to like, you know, line 6 or 7 or something. Some of the owners of intellectual property claim that unless copyright law is strengthened, intellectual property on the web will not uh, be protected from copyright infringement. So that's what they meant when they said strengthened. They meant um, new laws... Uh, Specifically what? Oh, well, it was the thing that, that we were really talking about here was should someone who links to copyrighted material uh, be guilty of copyright infringement? That's the strengthening that we're talking about. Is like applying copyright law to someone who links to something. So, A, are we making something more restrictive? Yes, I think we are. B, are we making it uniform worldwide? Absolutely not. Are we making it to impose harsher penalties? They never talked about penalties. They just talked about should this be copyright infringement or should it not be copyright infringement? If you read the passage, I think you can't pick harsher penalties because they just the penalties were not discussed. Uh, are we talking about dutifully enforcing those penalties? No, it was whether we should apply this category of crime to someone. Or not crime, but should we apply this uh, category of, should we apply copyright infringement to these new people that we've never applied it to before? E, are they more fully recognizing uh, as legitimate? I don't know what that means. It's A. We're going to make copyright law, they're, they're talking about whether to make copyright law more restrictive. 16A. 17. With which one of the following claims about documents placed on web pages would the author be most likely to agree? And I want to point out that that's a trap. They do not want you to put words in the author's mouth. They are not looking, I know it says the author would be most likely to agree, but that's not really what they're asking you. What they're asking you is, which one of these do you know for sure based on what the author already said? Which one of these does the author agree with? And ideally they have already said it. Okay? This is a must be true question. Reading comprehension questions are almost all must be true questions. So you need to be conservative, pick the boring, obvious answer on almost all of the reading comprehension questions. And I know that it looks like they want you to put words in the author's mouth here or go inside the author's head and like figure out what they're going to say next. 
but that is never what they're looking for you to do on the reading comprehension. So A, does the author say documents placed on web pages cannot receive adequate protection unless current copyright laws are strengthened? That's exactly the opposite of what the author is saying. Here's B. Such documents cannot be protected from unauthorized distribution without significantly diminishing the potential of the web to be a widely, formed, uh, widely used form of communication. It just did not go that far. The end part of that, the author never said that. The author didn't say, hey, if we do this copyright strengthening thing, people aren't going to use the web anymore. And that's what's conclusively wrong about B. Number 18, based on the passage, the relationship between strengthening current copyright laws and relying on passwords to restrict access to a web document is analogous to the relationship between what? Well, wait, the, they gave one analogy. The analogy was the whole uh, answering machine message. And so if you strengthen copyright laws, the relationship between strengthening copyright laws and relying on passwords to restrict access to a web document. Oh, passwords to restrict access to a web document, that's like having a blocked phone number or a private phone number. So, is this allowing everyone use of a public facility and restricting its use to members of the community? Huh. <coughs> Outlawing the use of a drug and outlawing its sale, prohibiting a sport and relying on participants to employ proper safety gear, <clears throat> passing a new law and enforcing that law, or allowing unrestricted entry to a building and restricting entry to those who have been issued a badge. Um, man. Okay, so the relationship between strengthening current copyright laws and relying on passwords to restrict access to a web document. So that's two different solutions. One is, hey, we're gonna strengthen these copyright laws and make it so that you can't ever link to any websites ever, which seems like a, a dramatic solution, okay? Maybe an overly dramatic solution. Or we could just uh, rely on passwords to restrict access to a web document so you can still put documents on the web. You could just put a password to protect it. So that's a less intrusive solution. So I'm looking for like a overly intrusive solution and then a less intrusive solution. Um, a, allowing everyone use of a public facility and restricting its use to members of the community. That doesn't, the first thing is not an overly restrictive, no, so it's not A. B, outlawing the use of a drug and outlawing its sale. Nah. C, prohibiting a sport Oh, or relying on participants to employ proper safety gear. I like that one so far, because it's like, well, hey, football's dangerous, let's ban it. Or, football's dangerous, let's make sure that the people who are doing football have the proper safety gear. That's like using passwords. Okay, so my answer there is C. Number 19, the passage most strongly implies which one of the following? And again, when it, when it says implies, I'm really thinking I would prefer it just says it. I think this is a must be true question. I'm looking for the most boring, obvious, safest one. A, did the passage basically say, there are no creators of links to web pages who are also owners of intellectual property on web pages? No way. That's way too strongly worded of an answer on a must be true question. There's nobody, there's not a single person in the entire world who makes a link and owns some intellectual property. No. B. The person who controls access to a web page document should be considered the distributor of that document. That seems like in line with what the passage would say. The passage was saying the person who puts the, the thing up on the web page is offering it for reproduction. Then later talks about you can also restrict access to a web page. So if it's your web page and you control access to it, then maybe you are the distributor of the document. I like B. C, did the passage say that rights of privacy should not be extended to owners of intellectual property placed on the web? I do not think it said that. Also, right of privacy, I don't think was even mentioned. I don't, I, I don't think so. D, those who create links to web pages have primary control over who reads the documents on those pages. That's the opposite of what the passage said. E, a document on a web page must be converted to a physical document via printing, 
before copyright infringement takes place. It never said you have to print in order to have copyright infringement. So my answer uh, for 19 is B. Number 20. According to the passage, which one of the following features of outgoing messages left on telephone answering machines is most relevant to the debate concerning copyright infringement? So which one of these was in the passage and is relevant to this debate about copyright infringement? A. Such messages are carried by an electronic medium of communication. I don't know that that's that relevant. I don't, I don't remember them pointing that out or anything. B. Such messages are not legally protected against unauthorized distribution. That's not the point. The, the telephone answering machine thing was an analogy and it doesn't have to be copyright protected. That's, that's not the point. C. Transmission of such messages is virtually instantaneous. I don't see how that was relevant to this debate. D, people do not usually care whether or not others might record such messages. That seems irrelevant to me. Uh, e, such messages have purposely been made available to anyone who calls that telephone number. I mean, that's just what they said when they brought up the telephone answering machine thing. They said, when you make the message, you're making it available for anybody who calls the number. That's what they said. So 20 E, just must be true. It's just which one of these was in the passage. 21. The author's discussion of telephone answering machines serves primarily to, in other words, why did they talk about telephone answering machines? Well, it was an analogy, and they were trying to show you the different, they were trying to say that, hey, if you give out somebody's phone number, that's like making a link. And, right, so we, we followed the analogy. If I understand the analogy, then I should be able to answer this, no problem. So, were we comparing and contrasting the legal problems created by two different sorts of electronic media. No, they were trying to show how it's like the same issue. Were we B, providing an analogy ah, to illustrate the positions taken by each of two sides in the copyright debate? Maybe. I like the word analogy there. <coughs> C, were we showing that the legal problems produced by new communication technology are not themselves new? No, it didn't say, hey, we've been having these problems forever. Was it D, illustrating the basic principle the author believes should help determine the outcome of the copyright debate? Uh, it was an illustration. This analogy was an illustration. Hmm. I'm tempted by D. E, are we showing that telephone use also raises concerns about copyright infringement? Definitely not. So here I've got it down to B and D. I'm going to reread both B and D. What was the primary purpose of them of, of even bringing up telephone answering machines? Was it B, an analogy illustrating the positions taken by each of the two sides in the copyright debate? I think it goes off the rails there after analogy. I just don't think that was the point of the analogy. The point of the analogy was to sort of say, hey, links are like giving out the phone number. That's not, here's what one side is saying, and here's what the other side is saying. So D, it's illustrating the basic principle the author believes should help determine the outcome of the copyright debate. The basic principle is, we can't ban somebody for giving out the phone number. It's hard to explain, but I, I think B is wrong because it doesn't describe correctly what's going on at the in the analogy, so I think the answer there is D. Is that right? I've got to be honest, right? I, I'm not 100% certain all the time on these questions. I read the passage. i got to understand the passage as much as I can. I read this question. I read the answer choices. I definitely narrow it down and get rid of the worst ones, but there's a lot of times when I'm going to get it down to a 50-50 and I'm going to have to reread them and I'm going to have to just, like, something stinks about one of the two remaining choices. I don't know exactly what it is, but it just doesn't feel right. That one's out, and the other one's my answer. And it's, it's funny because you'll feel like you're going to get it right 50% of the time. You'll feel like it's a 50-50, but you'll probably get it right like 90% of the time because your instincts will get really good when you do a lot of this practice. All right, last one. We'll get out of here. 22. According to the passage, present copyright laws, A, allow completely unrestricted use of any document placed by its author on a web page. You know... Did it say that? Did it say that we have, there's like basically no copyright on the web? I don't think so. 
Did the passage say that present copyright laws allow those who establish links to a document on a web page to control its distribution to others? I, I, I don't think that's what the passage said. The passage said the opposite of that. Do present copyright laws prohibit anyone but the author of a document from making a profit? No, that's, we didn't. Profit was never even mentioned. Uh, do present copyright laws allow the author of a document to sue anyone who distributes the document without permission? M maybe. I mean, that, I, I don't remember it saying that, but that's at least what I would think the copyright laws were currently doing. If you're actually distributing the document, then you could get sued by the author. I don't, I don't hate D. E, present copyright laws should be altered. No, they should not. So I'm going with D there just because I hate A, B, C, and E. It says D in line 20. And it says D in line 20. Okay, cool. So let me go back to line 20. This immediate accessibility creates a problem since current copyright laws give owners of intellectual property the right to sue a distributor, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so that's right. It's in the passage 22 uh, D. Any questions about reading comprehension? You don't have to read all four passages to get a good score. If you read three passages and you got them all right, you would be way above the class average. You know, the typical class average on a reading comprehension is only like 15 points. So three perfect passages puts you way ahead of the curve. Um, if you're only going to do three passages, it's totally possible that you could skip one of the passages if there's a topic that you don't like. Um, yeah? So this passage had eight questions. Yeah. Say it came last. Would you see that? Order. Maybe, maybe. Um, some of the, sometimes there'll be a passage that only has five questions and then another passage has eight. I guess I would, if I was ambivalent about the topic, but I was going to skip one of them, I would probably skip the one with fewer questions. Although you could also find examples of one where it turned out to be a really easy passage and five really easy questions. I mean, I don't think that this was a particularly easy passage, and I also don't think this was particularly easy questions, right? This was the one passage that you guys wanted me to read, which means that there, you guys probably had some problems. You saw me just straight up miss one of the questions, um, you know, which doesn't happen a lot. So this one was just kind of a tough one. It did have eight questions, but it would have taken a lot of time to get those eight points. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's probably a good strategy to just if you're going to only do three passages, if you know that you're only going to do three passages, I would say do the first three and then give yourself the option if one of the topics, you know, if I saw all of a sudden they were talking about poetry, I would just be like, out. And some of you would be like, if they start talking about science, then I'm out. Right? I'm seeing heads nodding. You guys want to skip the science one. I love the science ones. I think the science ones are actually, because it's more interesting, um, I, I get more out of the science ones, and I, I, it's like a topic that I actually want to learn about. But they're all answerable. You have to force yourself to pay attention to the passage and then just basically pick conservative answers that were said in the passage. I think if I could leave you with one thing about reading comprehension, it's that these questions are must-be-trues and that you have to be conservative about the answer choice. The, the, the answer you pick, it just has to be in the passage. Yeah? So if we're practicing this on our own, yeah. would you just re recommend like do it, like taking it slow, being diligent about it, and then over time like you get better? Are there like things we should be practicing while we're doing it? Uh, I would practice reading aggressively. I would practice making those little predictions as you read. Mm -hmm. You get done with the passage, you should always be able to predict the answer to the main point questions. Right? If you can't predict the answer to the main point question, that means you're like not getting it. But other than that, I would say slow and steady, focus on accuracy, that applies to the entire test. You know, you have to get them right. And if you get them right, you will accidentally get them right faster and faster. But if you try to go faster, you're not gonna get them right. And that's just like not understanding the test. Okay, so we're gonna understand the test, we're gonna like make, we're gonna decide that we're smart enough to understand the test and get the questions right. I know that's like a, crazy thing to say. But, you know, we, we have to believe that we are smart enough to just find the correct answer and be feeling pretty confident about it. If we can do that, then we will go faster and faster over time. That's my whole philosophy.